What's good, friends? This is episode 39 of the Game Pass Gamecast coming at you. While being quarantined for the current pandemic is the right and safest move, it doesn't make it any less boring. But luckily for us, video games can help make that time much, much more enjoyable. So this week, Mike and I sit down to put together a list of Xbox One and PC game recommendations that we think are the perfect companion piece while you practice social distancing over the next few weeks. Plus, is a GTA 6 reveal finally possible in the coming days? A new rumor points to that possibility. Also, Half-Life Alex is currently taking the VR world by storm, but does its success leave a sour taste in the mouths of long-term fans? All of this, and much more, on the newest quarantined episode of the Game Pass Gamecast. <laughs> now the fun begins. Bridget. Stop! You violated the law! Welcome back to another episode of the Game Pass Gamecast, your weekly go-to podcast for all things Xbox and Xbox Game Pass, including news, rumors, and conversations around them damn good video games. You could catch new episodes of the show each and every Friday morning when they drop on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and all other major podcast services. So be sure to subscribe to us wherever you get a podcast and follow us on Twitter at GPGC Podcast. Stay up to date with everything regarding the show, video games, like our giveaways, and everything else under the sun. Joining me as always... My partner in crime, Mike p -Pack. Mike, what's good? What's going on? And what have you been playing in these quarantine times, in this, you know, ever-changing, fucked-up world that we live in right now? <laughs> yeah, uh, I've just been having a steady diet of gaming. I've been um, playing some uh, Master Chief Collection on both PC and Xbox. I've been playing some Warzone. Uh, we've been mixing it up in the Warzone. But um, the games that I'm just kind of like mixing into my routine uh, i started streaming some dead by daylight again nice. and i've been having a lot of fun with that game the stranger things chapter is pretty cool um i mean i'm just i'm just enjoying mixing mixing some things into my life right now ninja gaiden 2 is on xbox game pass uh foreshadowing that might be a game i might recommend down the road we'll see <laughs> um but i've been mixing in some ninja gaiden 2 and uh NHL, Smite, uh, you name it, still kind of kicking it with those games. Mm -hmm. As far as new games I'm, I'm looking to get into, the group of guys that I play with are interested in trying that Fantasy Star Online 2 beta online oh, nice. on Xbox. So that might be the next game that I kind of get into, but um, just kind of, you know, steady mix, just mixing the games up because it's easy to get like kind of burnt out on a game. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to prevent that right now. Nice, nice. Yeah, it, it, it's... That time where it's like you have so much time to fill because exactly we can go outside. Like, granted, everyone else in the world is pretty much in the, a similar you know situation right now. But with us in the U.S., every state's kind of handling stuff differently. There's not a we're in a national pandemic right now, a national state of emergency. But every state's kind of handling how they want to quarantine people differently. So. <laughs> For us in Pennsylvania, uh, Governor Tom Wolf has said basically certain counties need to have shelter in place, which literally like they have to have a viable excuse to go out and, you know, do stuff in the county. Uh, our county that Mike and I are in isn't within that. Uh, it's right next to that county. So I would imagine relatively soon we're kind of <laughs> going to be at we're that next. Point. We're next. <laughs> um, but we are not. So we're still able to leave um, all non assistant non-essential businesses are technically closed um but walmart uh target grocery stores pharmacy stuff like that like there's still places open just not you know a GameStop. shockingly um after what they tried to pull but uh they are closed like places like that best buys closed um so you know it's mostly in our area it's it's starting to everyone's starting to hunker down finally and kind of chill inside so it is the perfect time to play a lot of video games um and it's the perfect time to kind of try a lot of different things because i've been kind of doing the same um with you guys at least uh, our group of friends has been trying to play something at least every day together for a little bit um just to get that social aspect in we've been playing like mike said a lot of mcc a lot of warzone um different things like that probably mix in some overwatch eventually uh just different things that are group of friends who play online can get together and kind of have that social aspect that, you know, we all can't necessarily go and do right now. We can't 
necessarily go to bars. We can't go out and do things like that. So, um, you know, gaming's always such a great thing to do with that. But like you were saying, Mike, um, been kind of doing a couple of different things. Me personally, um, the major one that I've been playing is Doom Eternal. Shocker. Um, but I just, I thought I was going to be able to beat it before we started recording today. Did not. Got super, super close. I'm like right at the end. Uh, I have something going on a little bit later today. So kind of, kind of was in a little like, uh, eh, I better stop now. Um, so just to make sure we, you know, got a full episode recording and everything like that. And it wasn't truncated, but, um, kind of just want to run through my top level impressions of it. Um, and I'm a, it's a game I'm eventually going to 100%. It's a game that I want to go back in and do all that. So that probably says right off the bat, I like it. It's a great game. Um, at the base level, just looking at it, it's more Doom, which is very good because more Doom 2016. Um, sure, which, right. Which, you know, it's it's fast-paced, it's traditional Doom, which is great, only dialed up to 11, um, which a lot of people want. They didn't want the formula to change too much. I, personally, I'm starting to enjoy it more and more and more as I go on, um, and maybe my expectations were a little higher than I expected it to be. Uh, but right now, gun to my head, I'd probably choose Doom 2016 over Doom Eternal. Um, but that being said, I haven't finished it yet. I haven't completely tied it off. Um, but it's an excellent, excellent, excellent game. It it doesn't lean into, at least me personally, it leans more into, it feels like at times I'm playing Quake, compared to doom um sure and that's not and that's not a knock like i like quake uh they're basically you know tomato tomato at sometimes you know they're from the same lineage um especially in terms of their multiplayer where you look at how you know doom advanced with its multiplayer in the last game it was very much quake and you look at something like quake champions it's it, you're getting that fast-paced arena shooting that is missing in a lot of FPS games now. It's much more tactical, which is great in that, you know, fits into an audience and, you know, BRs have taken over so much in the online eco space that you don't really have that arena shooter that you see with a traditionally like Quake or something like that. And Quake Champions necessarily hasn't caught on, I'm sure, as Bethesda has hoped. Um, but at the same time, though, that's not a bad thing. Um, it just doesn't... It leans into the demonic shit, which is obvious, but it, it's more futuristic at times. And that's where I feel... I feel the... You could really see the Quake emphasis in it, um, which is not a bad thing. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I'm really looking forward to tying it off. Um, it's a little longer than I expected it to be. I mean, in terms of how it feels. And maybe that's just because... I know that, like, I also want to play Animal Crossing. I haven't touched it. I bought it, and I haven't opened it up yet because I want to play Doom to talk about it on the show. It's an Xbox show. Um, so knowing that that's there, and I kind of want to, you know, stream a couple of different games, and, you know, we're playing Halo and things like that. So it's like my mind's in a couple different places with games, so maybe I'm just noticing it's a little bit longer, but or feeling a little bit longer. But, you know, it's probably about 10 12 hours and you know i'm close to the end but you know enemy enemy um like the amount of different enemy types that are in it is great they've evolved on everything that you saw in you know doom 2016 they bring in super tough enemies like the marauder which is a pain in the ass if you play the game you'll definitely know what i'm talking about um it's it really has evolved the formula but at the same time kept it intact so it is, I do agree, it is, and probably this is because we haven't seen a ton of great first-person shooter campaigns this generation, or ones that stuck out, but uh, Doom Eternal definitely is up there with them, if not the best of this generation for sure, um, right alongside Doom 2016. So I give it two thumbs way up. Um, I, if I had to put a number on it, it's itching a nine. Um maybe there's a couple instances that I'm like, eh. if I was playing on PC, to be honest, I'd probably easily give it a nine. Um, that fast paced control that's needed for doom doesn't, I still don't think translates super well to console. Um, 
just because it's such in, in inertly like a PC game. You could just feel that this is a PC game, the way you move, the way you aim. It's so fast paced, uh, it has that arena feel, like I kept saying. So excellent game. I highly recommend it. Uh, if you can maybe play it on PC, if you have a PC that can run it. Um, if not, still definitely worth it's it in all purpose in all intents and purposes it is a nine on console still um it is an excellent first person camp or yeah first person campaign um but i haven't touched multiplayer i don't know if i will i still think that's going to be the one thing that holds it back because doom 2016's multiplayer was pretty bad um and nobody really hooked on to it. Battle mode looks cool. I may play it a little bit, but I'm buying Doom for the campaign, like 99% of other people who do that. So um, I'm definitely looking forward to at least trying it out. But overall, in terms of what you get for, you know, you're going and picking this up for 60 bucks, it's well worth the $60. Because uh, there's so much exploration that you can do after. And um, it really, comparative to 2016, I feel does a great job at not forcing you, but giving you all the tools to make you want to go and do all the exploration things, the nooks and crannies. And it really builds upon the smaller amounts of RPG elements that the first one had and really kind of fleshes that out, but not in an overcomplicated way. There's, you know, suit points that you get, your arsenal points, uh, weapon perks, everything like that. It's really, really cool. Um, uh, maybe we'll do a long form, you know, in review of it after a while, maybe I'll make a video about it. But, uh, for right now, Highly recommend it, and uh, yeah, definitely check that out. I wanted to read our winner of the Doom Eternal giveaway. Give us a little review. Uh, Geeks underscore 361, thank you so much for listening, to Congratulations on winning that again. He beat it, I believe he sent me a DM on Monday, saying he did, because I told him, you know, definitely let me know how you like it. So, he said, hey, just finished Eternal, and I have to say it was really something. I enjoyed every minute of it, and we'll be going back for each collectible. Hope you have a similar experience. So, once again, Geeks, thank you so much for entering, following us, doing all that jazz, and supporting us. And also, congratulations for winning it. Glad you liked it. So, uh, with that being said, on top of that, outside of that, uh, like I said, been playing some Halo with you guys. Been doing some Warzone. Uh, which is still, it, it's still fun, but, you know, it's having that same effect of every Battle Royale where you, you, it just kind of wears on you after a while um, that I'd rather play, you know, something more traditional like Halo. Anything else. Or, yeah, or <laughs> Overwatch or something like that, you know, so uh, it's, that has been nice. And there's a couple things, you know, outside of the Xbox and PC, you know, ecosystem that i'm going to play like i said animal crossing adam's been playing a ton about that and he's speaking very highly of it so i'm, I'm excited to get into that um life is strange too i started with my fiance we're definitely going to dive into that during quarantine so um there's a couple things else you know things that i do want to play but uh yeah i'm kind of like you kind of dipping a toe in a bunch of stuff but doom was the main game that i wanted to make sure I finished, or at least got close to finishing before this week's episode, and it is definitely a treat. I highly, highly recommend it. So, with that being said, Mike, let's get into the episode, and we got a few news articles. Nothing super, super crazy, just because, you know, everyone's kind of bunkered down right now. Uh, I feel like it's going to be a little bit light on news for a while, but, you know, at least some rumors and stuff we'll kind of dive into, but... First one, actual hard-hitting news article here. Microsoft CEO Satya Nadala says hardware supply chains coming back online, but demand is the issue. Uh, this comes from Jordan Novit over on CNBC. Microsoft CEO Satya Nadala, I hope I said that right, said Tuesday that the hardware supply chain is coming back online as the coronavirus outbreak eases up in Asia, but said that the big question would be whether demand holds up in the U.S. and Europe. Quote, on the supply side, we are getting back on rails, Nadal told CNBC's John Ford. When asked about whether Microsoft would be able to deliver later this year certain projects that it had promised before COVID-19 took hold, like the new Surface devices and a revamped Xbox console. Nadella, Microsoft's third CEO, has recast the company's more... More recast the company more as a cloud service and infrastructure provider, moving away from its ex historical focus on PC software like Windows and Office since he took over from Steve Ballmer in 2014. The company has still been financially hit from the disease. It said last month it wouldn't be able to, to reach its revenue guidance range for the quarter for the division of the, of 
the business that contains Windows. Several other companies have followed taking down guidance. So, Mike, just because it kind of kicks off the conversation a little bit and people now have been talking about, you know, what's this mean for next-gen consoles, both, you know, on the Sony side and Microsoft side. So, you know, obviously the COVID-19 pandemic has really kind of thrown a multitude of wrenches into the launch plans for both Xbox Series X and PlayStation 5, with some sources saying that, yeah, they're going to be delayed, you know, they're going to be delayed past that holiday 2020 release date, while others at the same time who are, you know, kind of ingrained in the industry, in the gaming industry, are saying everything they're hearing, they're still on target to hit them. So, you know, what does your gut say, Mike? What will we see for the Xbox Series X? Will it hit its current holiday 2020 launch date, or do you think it'll get bump, uh, bumped into the spring of 2021, something like that? Um, I don't I don't know. It's, it's definitely tough. I think it's a situation that, Obviously, nobody has really foreseen was coming down the pipe. Um, it's literally impossible to plan for something like this. Mm-hmm. It's something that in the current day and age of society, nobody would ever think would be possible for the entire world to kind of be at a standstill um, for the moment. Yeah, <laughs> like shut down for this. I mean, Asia is starting to come back up, which is promising. But mm. I do think, um, I think that the supply chain will be fine per mm-hmm. um, Sadia's. Uh, you know, recommend or um, observance that he thinks that, you know, they're going to be up and running and er everything's going to be okay, which I'm sure is the truth. Um, Demand being the issue is certainly a unique situation because previous launches for most of these consoles have come with shortages, uh, Mm -hmm. especially like the Xbox 360. Like I've said in episodes past, the Xbox 360 was really hard to get at first. People were reselling on eBay, doing things of that nature. That's something that I was kind of concerned about for the new Xbox. I figured that there might be a bit of supply issue. Um, However, you know, with the coronavirus kind of tanking the economy, especially in America, although we're getting some different news today with the bailout stuff and the stimulus package that could be coming through, all that kind of stuff might change the trajectory a tad bit. Mm -hmm. But by and large, the biggest people that this is going to hit is like, families uh that we're gonna buy their kids the new xbox or new playstation Mm -hmm. um for christmas like christmas is probably gonna be light this year because people are starting to realize that they need to have money to fall back on they can't just spend till they don't have any more money to spend and then they're gonna get paid again and do it all over again Mm -hmm. i think that this is gonna change a lot i think you'll see the saving percentage in america go up um Mm -hmm. I think uh, it's not going to go crazy like Switzerland. You know, Switzer- uh, people in Switzerland traditionally save like 30% of their income. Mm-hmm. It's not going to be that crazy. But, I mean, right now, Americans spend around 96% of their income. Um, so they're only saving 4%. Canada is only like one of the only worst countries that are like 98% spenders. Mm-hmm. So I would, I would imagine there's going to be a lot more saving going on, which in turn will kind of – it's going to handcuff these these um, these companies like Microsoft and Sony. They're not going to – they have projections based on what they think they were going to sell. Mm-hmm. Obviously, they've worked hard. They've used previous history. They've used research to figure out how many, ga- or how many consoles do we have to make to be able to supply it for everybody that wants one. Mm-hmm. That's all like – you can pretty much just throw it in a dumpster at this point. That's all out the window. So a pushback to, to um, spring, I mean, it's not – I, I don't, it's not going to get bumped. Uh, the consoles are going to come out in the fall. Uh, they might come out, um, or they're going to come out like, you know, when they were supposed to come out in 2020. They're not going to get pushed back, especially if the supply chain's up and running again. There's no reason to push it back just because there might not be as many people to buy it. Mm-hmm. But I think what they'll do is they'll have the amount of consoles that they were going to make. So if the economy was to rebound very soon, maybe there would be enough time that they could make the adjustment and be able to have a decent supply but as of right now they are going to you know answer to this coronavirus situation Mm -hmm. they're gonna you know lower their production amount by a large scale and you're gonna just you're just gonna have shortages if if people want to go out and spend the money on consoles this year just like every other year in the past there's going to be extreme shortages if the economy were to just like within the next month or two flip it on its head again and, and be going back up if this coronavirus was just to disappear, which it's not gonna, and the economy's not gonna rebound, so they're gonna plan accordingly. Mm-hmm. But um, I mean, you can't fault them; it, it just makes business sense for them. But I, I wouldn't say, I mean, a pushback to spring of twenty one. You have game devs that are you know putting games out for these new consoles and stuff. I really doubt it, but 
Mm-hmm. Anything's possible. Again, like I said before I went on this, uh, before I was talking about this particular subject, uh, we didn't think anything like this could happen. And I don't think anything like pushing a whole console back could happen mm-hmm. other than like there being a colossal issue with the supply. Like every single one of their processor chips are melting down. Like, okay, they're going to push it back. But yeah. by and large, I don't, I don't see that coming. I just see a, a major supply shortage. Yeah. I, I'm kind of in the same camp as you. I definitely think they'll they'll still hit the both consoles, not just Xbox and uh, you know, not just Xbox, but PlayStation Five as well. I think they see that as especially Microsoft being ahead of the kind of the curve this time. And granted, you know, pushing still pushing the Xbox One as a viable option because they're saying this is now the family of Xbox systems. Um, you know, so at the same time, they've also realized, okay, pretty early on this generation, hey, we we took the L, we we got hit, you know, they came, Sony came out, put their foot on her throat, and just you know took old Yeller out back. They took care of business, and they took care of business early. With that said, I'm sure that they've been planning for this console specifically before Sony was like, okay, let's start planning for PlayStation 5, knowing that, okay, we, you know, got shit on the first half of this generation. We really need to start. We need to make sure we put as much R&D into the Xbox Series X, now known, as before. You know, Project Scarlet needs to be that our coming back party type of thing. Our, a re, you know, almost a reboot of the Xbox experience. Um, Mm -hmm. So, to me... I think Xbox has been technically in terms of, you know, putting this system together and planning for the system a little bit further than Sony has. So I feel more confident in Xbox hitting that, you know, uh, holiday 2020 release date, which there was an issue that I think it was earlier. It was either early this week or late last week that the, I think it was like Microsoft's New Zealand or Xbox's New Zealand website had the holiday 2020 changed on their website to Thanksgiving 2020, almost more of a concrete date. Um, Yeah. They changed it back just for wording's sake. I'm sure that's what it meant, but I mean, holiday 2020 for release date to me says November. um, Yeah. When typically they've all been released in terms of a fall release date for consoles Um, outside of, I think, was the Xbox 360 of October? I think it might have been October. I, don't um, know. I can't remember. I can't really remember. It's been a long time. It's something. Uh, I mean, it I'll was definitely it, it was definitely that fall. Um, but point being, I I see this more as especially considering, like you said, Asia's starting to slowly come back online now. They're starting. Um, to... November twenty second, two thousand five. Oh, wow. Wow, I thought in the United there. States, yeah, December second for Canada, and then Europe December tenth, and in Japan. Wow. No wait, 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 wait. Can oh wait, Canada was November twenty second, December second for Europe, and then December tenth for Japan. Gotcha. Yeah, I thought it was earlier than that for some reason. Oh well. Um, but uh, like you were saying, Asia's starting to kind of go back to work. Um, China. Uh, you know, the Russian areas, stuff like that. Like, they're all starting to come back onto work, which helps console manufacturing, considering so much is outsourced to China for production. That it's, you know, that may be hitting at a good time because full production probably wouldn't be starting until now, between now and, like, another couple, like, another month or two. You know, somewhere in that window is when they're probably going to start churning these out or at least getting final prototypes for the most part, saying, okay, this is the exact, you know, CAD speci- specification we're going for, boom, let's start mass manufacturing those. So they're in that point where they're kind of nailing it down right now, you would imagine. So that may actually help them, you know, not help them, but the timing may work in their favor with this. Um, so I'm I'm more seeing, uh, if anything, a supply side where, you know, or a demand, in your, like you're saying, where people are wanting these and it's not in stock. It's not as readily available as people would hope because of maybe not having as many workers to get this out and produce as much um, in terms of getting these systems there. Um, Or from in terms of actually physically getting the shipments from store to store, stores not being open, yada, yada. You know, who knows? I would would 
imagine, I would ho- be so hopeful, it bl- I'd be absolutely out of my mind at thinking that, you know, by the time these consoles launch, things will at least be back to quote-unquote normal. Or at least, you would hope on a trajectory to have us in a more normal state, people were working again, and, you know, people are hopefully, the economy starting to at least turn in the right direction, not necessarily completely rebounding. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, like your point, you know, who knows, this may be, you know, people may not have the income to actually spend on these as much anymore. Um, so it may be one of those things too, just because, you know, if the unemployment rate gets to 30%, like they're thinking it might, you know, it's, that doesn't necessarily, you know, help anybody's favors on Sony and Microsoft's end trying to get these consoles. So it'll be interesting, sadly. So let's move on to the next one here. This one's more of a rumor, Mike. Um, and it's just, you'll know that it's a slow news week just for the sole fact that we're bringing up a Grand Theft Auto 6 um, rumor. Um, there, it, it, that's the. It's one of those games that literally, even if like GTA 5 launched, say like it's October of 2013, GTA's, GTA 5's launching, like people are already like, oh, I they're hinting at GTA 4 or GTA 6 already. Look, look, like it's just one of those games that literally is always every gta is always like the most rumored game of all and nobody ever gets them right um but this one is kind of interesting and even though jason schreier said that came out and said from kotaku that the date on this end probably isn't is kind of nonsense he didn't necessarily comment on the rest of it um in terms of the possibility of finding getting information on gta soon but let's uh let's just jump into it um this comes from over on inverse by danny pez GTA 6 website update seems to confirm a major reveal is about to happen. Grand Theft Auto 6 remains unconfirmed yet inevitable, but an announcement could finally arrive extremely soon. Previous GTA 6 rumors indicated that Rockstar Games might announce the game in late March. Now fans on Reddit have found compelling evidence to suggest that Rockstar does indeed have something major planned, and it might happen any day now. Redditor user Bozidarlik, I don't know. Baza Darlick, it's a Reddit user, so I'm not yeah. necessarily worried about pronouncing it right, um, shared on Monday that they had discovered Rockstar's parent company, Take-Two Interactive, had updated the website domain gtavi.com. This comes days after chatter on message boards, GTA forums, and 4chan, uh, the most reliable place in the world, 4chan, claimed some kind of GTA 6 announcement would happen this week. The timing makes it seem like Rockstar is readying its site with major art assets and perhaps even a teaser trailer to show the world what it's been cooking up since the 2013 release of, of GTA 5. But user, Reddit user's post, um, I'm not even going to try to say his name again, going to GTA 6.com would redirect to Rockstar's main site for GTA 5. The domain now redirects anyone who visits it to an air. Rockstar Games clearly made some kind of deliberate change on the back end for some reason. So this is a big hint that the developer could soon use that URL to house new information that hasn't been unlocked yet. That has wiped the game's diehard fan base into a frenzy. A Reddit post from another Reddit user found evidence that Take Two has updated its GTA domains every two years. The Redditor posted that this information as if it were Further evidence that a big announcement is coming, but many people in the comments took it as a sign that Take Two was simply doing a routine update on all domains, uh, all on all of the domains it owns. So, I I tend to believe the the tail end of that um, more than anything. But you know, we we've talked about Adam and I at least Rockstar in length a few episodes ago. But I kind of want to get your take on this, Mike. When do you think we'll see GTA 6? What even is GTA 6 with how successful Grand Theft Auto Online is? And what would that mean for Rockstar's other stable of franchises? Um, You know, and just to kind of set the table, it's really, it wouldn't necessarily be unheard of for Rockstar to premiere and a reveal trailer and promotional, you know, initial promotional material for its next project around this time frame as it is, because GTA, just kind of looking back, GTA 5, they showcase it in, I think, at the end of 2011, about 18 months out, and it was maybe, you know, 
actually no, it was 18 months after Red Dead 1 launched, and then it was two years out, yeah, two years out from the actual game launching GTA 5. Um, and then same with Red Dead 2, where they showed Red Dead 2 pretty much like two years before that came out, right around the same time period. So it's it's not unheard of. Um, and it's not, it wouldn't be unfathomable to think considering, you know, it's last entry was what now, you know, seven years ago, basically mm-hmm. almost. So, it's, right. you know, what do you, like I said, what do you, what do you think, when do you think we'll see GTA six or any kind of promotional material for GTA six? When, do, what even is GTA six and with how successful GTA online is and, what would that mean for Rockstar's other staple franchises? Red Dead, uh, Bully, Manhunt, everything like that. I, it's it's this is a tough question, and this is like it's been a while since I made a heel turn on the on the show. <laughs> I mean, I've been critical of companies, mm-hmm. but I haven't quite been a heel since a, a long. It's been a it's been a long yeah. list of episodes of me not being a heel. Yeah, but let's get our let's get our tinfoil caps on All right, and let's let's, let's make the heel turn all right i'm ready for it i'm gonna go there Tell me. And going there is i've seen this movie before okay and let me let me lay out the plot to you and i'll think you'll know the answer you probably already know the answer of what i'm about to get to let's hear but it. let's just say that there was a company that everything they touched turned to gold every game that they released was immaculate everyone loved it mm-hmm Everybody thoroughly enjoyed playing their games. They were groundbreaking. They were writing all kinds of great story-driven games. Mm-hmm. They were just doing such a great job. And then all of a sudden, they started to become a little bit complacent. And then they released a game like GTA V, which single-player-wise, it's it's not horrible. But mm-hmm. um, some people, you know, it, it left some to, something to be desired. But, of course, they came out with GTA Online, mm-hmm. which has kind of transformed the game. And now most people buy GTA just to play the online feature which to each their own if that's the thing you enjoy that's completely fine and just to kind Um, of throw into that caveat and this applies to red dead 2 as well well right i was just about to go there too has never never got dlc to it single player dlc like yeah the rockstar game but continue just wanted to throw that in there they make too much money off of the of people buying it to play online which is whatever and then they make red dead redemption 2 and People had been clamoring for a sequel to Red Dead Redemption 1, and they come out with a prequel, which, you know, whatever, it's okay. You can kind of do your own thing because everyone just wanted another Red Dead. It Mm -hmm. didn't have to necessarily be a sequel because where do you go from there? Mm -hmm. But the prequel, everyone was like pumped about it. Then they released the game and most diehard Red Dead fans like myself, like you, like I haven't ever even finished it. Like, it's just I I finished it, it, but I did leave it. It. It did drag out a little bit. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it, but obviously, even whenever I talk about it, I'm pretty open in saying I connected with Red Dead 1 much more. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, there's more than one reason um, for people to maybe be a little critical of Red Dead 2. But, I mean, all in all, um, it, was, it was okay, but it wasn't quite the polished great game you'd expect from rockstar much Mm -hmm. like gta 5 compared to gta 4 and red dead 1 so it's they're beginning to traverse down this path and and you might know the answer but dare i call them like treading that same or walking that same line that bethesda walked everything they released was just incredible they went from elder scrolls 3 to elder scrolls 4 great Mm -hmm. games they went to skyrim um, for Elder Scroll diehards, not really that great for but it was the such casual a, gamer. It was such just a casual humongous. Hit, yeah, exactly. And then you had Fallout Three and New Vegas, terrific games. Mm-hmm. Then Fallout Four comes out, and it's a tu- it's a turd. Fallout Seventy Six comes out, it's a turd. Mm-hmm. Um, I-, I can make really like scary comparisons between Rockstar and Bethesda. Mm-hmm. Um, both still good developers. Yeah, but it. it they're both, I, I'm, they're both developers that now you may not you know completely, but with Rockstar, but I feel safe to say that whenever they show us the first material for Starfield or especially Elder Scrolls Six, I'm gonna be hyped just because yeah, like well, I still too. have that right. I still have that connection with that developer that I know. I know like we both know what they've put out in the past. We know what mm-hmm. they're capable of. We know what Todd Howard is capable of, considering he's given us 
one of the best RPGs of all time, in my opinion, Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, that yep. you see what they've done, and even if they don't hit that high note every time, you see what mm-hmm. they've done with that, what they've done with Fallout 3, what they've done with Skyrim, even though Skyrim was more casual, it still was a very well-received game and wasn't a quote-unquote bad game by any means. Right. That they still developed something that people still hold in such a beloved fashion today that, you know, Fallout 4, misstep. Fallout mm-hmm. New or Fallout 76, though, as a Bethesda game studio public or developed game, an in-house developed game, was a sidestep again. It was the first real, like, kind of knocked on your ass like shit maybe you know where fans started to think fuck maybe they don't have it you know okay fall off yeah. they kind of fall off a little bit with whatever but you know and i'm getting off track here but point being with rockstar you know there were so many people that you know loved red dead one and loved gta 4 that even with gta 5 people are like okay i see what you're going for and i still really like it but like i didn't finish gta 5 up until recently like a couple months ago because i just never truly had that desire to go and finish it like there was i never had that desire with a gta but i still love them and i still knew how good they were especially you know with gta 4 and how it got excellent dlc single player dlc not let alone with red dead getting one of the best dlcs in gaming of all time with undead nightmare like I, it's just hard to imagine what like, I wouldn't be shocked, you know, and I'll I'll kick it over to you to kind of, you know, cap off your the answers to the questions I threw at you. But, you know, I can't, I wouldn't be shocked. Rockstar's still one of those developers and publishers that can literally put out a trailer, a reveal trailer, announce a game out of the blue, and people wouldn't be shocked of that method. Like there's no build up to it. They're just, they've always done that because they'll control, they, they control the messaging and the gaming ecosystem so much with having two of the biggest IPs in gaming currently, especially the most profitable gaming IP of all time in Grand Theft Auto that they could do that. They could throw it out there and people are completely in. Um, so it is, I, I understand why so many rumors kick up because it could literally be any day now that we see something. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, to me, what scares me the most is the fact that okay, we didn't get we didn't get DLC for Grand Theft Auto Five single player DLC because we got so much with on online blew up and they wanted to lean into that because a lot of players were asking for that. Okay, cool. And times change. That's totally fine. DLC isn't necessarily like a super common thing anymore. Single player DLC that is for a ton of games, which is cool. Not that big of a deal. But what worried me was when we didn't get it for red dead 2 and that's where i'm like okay this is very much a this game is getting accolades for its single player it's not getting accolades for red dead online necessarily people like it but it's nowhere near the success of gta online where if you want to keep both of the if you want to be basically a dual ip studio kind of like bethesda game studios is with elder scrolls and fallout where they have two big ips you got to support Support that you you got to keep that in you know its namesake vibrant and you know people aware of that it's got to be in that zeitgeist still with okay cool you pay sixty dollars again for three years worth of dlc that comes out or something you know like something like that where it's just a handful of new missions every couple months like they got enough people working there that you know they got to be working on something besides gta online so right in Red Dead Online, you know, that's only a fraction of their studio. So so what do you think? What does GTA Online or what does GTA 6 look like to you? And, you know, <laughs> what what's that mean for the rest of them? Really? I um, guess you kind of answer that. But what's what's GTA 6 even look like? Is it primarily online? Do we even get that much single player content? Is it more of a, you know, a division like game where it's hmm. okay you have a couple of main single player missions but after that the game opens up and you have end game content well the year is 2020 so basically <laughs> we've learned this year if not any year past mm-hmm. that anything could happen mm-hmm. it could be a primarily online experience it could be I, you know what like what if it is just dlc for the gta 5 single player or, and multiplayer like it's not yeah. even a full game anything could really happen um it's just one of those things that 
we've talked, you know, we kind of talked about it there briefly where, you know, you say, um, you know, certain, certain devs and, 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 uh, like Bethesda and, uh, Rockstar, you know, they kind of set up their own, we'll call it like their own standard. Like there's games, Mm -hmm. there's good games and there's a Bethesda and then there's a Rockstar game and they're both different. But when a dev studio is that legendary, what's up? I said there's expectations with them. Yeah, there's different expectations. So like Mm -hmm. you said, even though those games might not have been bad, they're just not what you've come to expect from those dev studios. Mm -hmm. I think GTA six would, I think you have to include single player. Mm -hmm. The legacy of the entire franchise is based off of the single player, Mm -hmm. even though they didn't, you know, they didn't focus on it as they did on GTA five. But like you said, no DLC, it's kind of weird, weird dichotomy going on there. I think GTA six is going to be like a split down the middle. It's Mm going to be, there's going to be single player stuff you can do, but it almost feels like they're going to make it where you can choose to play offline. But most of it is going to be like you're logged in and you're in the online world. So like you could have the option to just play single player, but by and large, the entire game is going to be based off online. If that makes any sense, um, you'll have the option to play offline. You'll have the option to do single player missions, mm-hmm. but the main experience is going to be based on online experiences. And there's going to be different types of servers. You see the role play servers going on right now. Mm-hmm. They're kind of popular online. I think that they're going to split the servers up into like PVP and a PVE type thing, kind of like how wild, you know, does it mm-hmm. or did it for a long time and continues to do it. I think you're going to have the option of actually playing the game, not against other humans. Mm -hmm. um, Or you're going to have like a PVP situation going on. I think that's what the, what the experience is going to be. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't be shocked by that either. Um, I definitely think after them seeing how prevalent and financially successful, especially how successful GTA online was for GTA five and how much it's literally now its own entity that. They're not going to lean into that. Like they would, how how can they not lean into that? Like to me, that just it it just screams like we're going to, we're going to go this being just a straight up live service game. Um, mm-hmm. I I think like you said, there's going to be an element, a single player element, even with like a Fallout seventy six, a Division. Mm-hmm. There is single player elements. I mean, with the Division two, I've only been playing really the single player stuff. I haven't touched the Dark Zone yet. I haven't done any pvp or anything like that it's all pve stuff for you know single player stuff but there's not as much depth to it that i like would come to know from bethesda for example with fallout 76 like they're pushing this as no this is a fallout game this is this even compare it to fallout 4 fallout 4 is clearly a fallout game compared to fallout 76 and how that's presented so to me it just it's worrisome I just don't want Rockstar to completely abandon, you know, the cow that got him to the farm show type of thing. That's like a, you know, a Westmoreland County type thing. Yeehaw! You know, <laughs> considering we live on the boonies. You, you get or or pig. We, we have some pig farmers out here that show, or, like, world-class pigs. Yeah. Which, hey, is impressive. That Right. Like, I mean, you want to talk about world-class pig, you're talking about myself, man, after I ate some of those tacos last night, you know? <sighs> Anyways, <laughs> uh, Mike, let's move on to the last news article here. This one on for our PC friends over there, which they're having a field day right now. Half-Life Alex makes top 25 concurrent daily players list on Steam. This comes from Harry Baker over on Upload VR. As always, all these links are in the, the description of the episode. Make sure you go over there, give them a click. Make sure you get them a view over there. So... March 23rd was a big day for Valve, Half-Life, and VR fans alike. Valve's flagship VR title, Half-Life Alex, finally released to the world, and we are huge fans. While it doesn't do everything exactly right, the things it does do are absolutely sublime and makes it one of the B- best, one of VR's best titles, without a doubt. This is obviously their portion of a review that they threw in there. It looks like it was a fairly su- successful launch day for Alex as well. According to Steam statistics available from Valve, each day users can visit the, this site and see the concurrent players for any game at that point along with peak concurrent players for the day. At the time of writing, Half-Life Alex peaked at 42,858 players on release day. That put it in the top 25 titles for the day, at least at the time of writing. It is also notably the only VR game in both the top 25 and the entire visible concurrent players list. So, 
you know, Alex is getting rave reviews and being touted as the first true reason you need to physically go out and buy VR. You need to own VR. Like, this is the reason to buy VR. You know, it's it's the Breath of the Wild to Switch seller. You know, it's the Halo to original Xbox. You need to, this is the reason to go and buy that, hands down. Um, you know, which is a big, massive step, you know, forward for their, that platform and the VR genre in general, you know. And while it's great to really see so many people enjoying the title, especially long-term Half-Life fans, you know, people like Adam, even though he hasn't got a chance to play with it, he's happy that, you know, Half-Life is at least back in the zeitgeist of what's going on. Mike, does it rub you the wrong way that one of gaming's most cherished IPs in, you know, Half-Life is having its comeback kind of put on a platform that is still very much niche with only a very small fraction of PC gamers owning a compatible VR headset, let alone a PC beefy enough to run it, you know? And also really, what what does this mean for the franchise? Do we finally see Half-Life 3 in a traditional fashion? Is I guess the question is, is Valve back, quote-unquote? I think you'd like to see... um, You'd obviously like to see it, the game offered to a wider audience. Mm -hmm. With it being top 25 concurrent viewers, that means there's a lot more people... Is or the the question becomes like, is there that many people that actually own VR, or is it a situation where the games there aren't that many games being played? Like, there's not a wide variety of many players in certain games, mm-hmm. so that's why it's doing so well. Um, I think you kind of look at it in, in, in a way that for people that don't have VR, it kind of stinks, especially because the price of getting a computer that can handle a VR. Um, I mean, it's getting better. Like, yeah, you're still looking at like anywhere between a thousand to fifteen hundred bucks alone just for the exactly PC. just for the PC. That's yeah. before you even get the headset. Yeah. So, with all that being said, yeah, you would like to see it more available for everybody. Mm-hmm. Especially as a Half Life fan, you would definitely like to see more people being able to play this and enjoy this experience. Mm-hmm. Valve is a is a company that's like for a long time now. You could argue that's like basically not for like they're not even like a game dev studio. It's just kind of like they run steam. Mm -hmm. They release counter-strike like half-assed go updates. Um, They put a ton of money into the Dota scene. Mm -hmm. Um, Since portal, what really have they done game design wise, you know, like, Mm -hmm. so it's just a weird thing. Now they made their transition a long time ago when they came out with steam Mm -hmm. and they still do produce some games. I think Half-Life fans, it's it's a bitter reality for them to realize that, yes, Half-Life Alex is only on VR, but you should probably be happy that you got a Half-Life Alex at all. It True. felt like this studio, it was dead. It felt like Half-Life was dead. Mm-hmm. Whether the creative, the creative spark for Half-Life was gone or the dev studio was just like, that's it, like, I don't really want to do Half-Life anymore. Nobody really wants to do Half-Life anymore. It's perfect the way it is. If they want to play one and two again to get that experience, that's up to them. But for us, it's almost, it almost felt like a Bungie situation, right? Like where Bungie just kind of said at the end of Halo, it was like Reach was like felt like a half-assed attempt at making a Halo game. And it was like, we're done. Like mm-hmm. we've had Halo for how long it's time to move on, which for better or worse, um, that's the way it was with that. It definitely feels that way with Valve. Um, I don't know that I'm upset. Obviously, you could be disappointed that you would have to have a VR to play Alex. Uh-huh. You would like to just get a straight up Half Life Three experience, but I mean, for all intents and purposes, based on my my like viewing of the situation, basically just be happy with what you got rather than like being like, oh, I I just want a Half Life Three. Forget Alex. Um, I would say I would have to feel disappointed but not mad not angry Mm -hmm. not rub it doesn't rub me the wrong way like it doesn't grind my gears Mm -hmm. i think i mean they're pushing they're pushing vr headset sales um with this game and from what i've watched on streams it's pretty cool um it's a different vr experience like Doom VR, when I played it with you at your, uh, or when, when I played it with you, Mm -hmm. it was a not Doom 16, but it was Doom VR. And that's very important for everyone to realize if they came out with a Halo VR game, you have to realize it's not Halo 3. It's not Halo 5. 
it's not Halo 1, it's Halo VR. They're their right. own flavor. They're yeah. different. And I think that's the thing that might rub me the wrong way is the fact that you're getting an experience that's designed solely for VR Mm -hmm. and it's not a Half-Life game to me. It's Half-Life VR, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I mean, looking at it and from watching some streams of it and whatnot, it's it's definitely you could you could physically see that it is a step forward for VR. You know, mm-hmm. it, and like you're saying, you, excellent example with Doom VR. Um, you know, it was not when you're thinking, oh, we're gonna put when Bethesda's like, you know what, we're bringing Doom to VR, and it's coming out on PlayStation VR. You know, the console version of VR and PC VR platforms. When really it is okay, you're going through a handful of Doom levels, and it's not an on rails thing, but you're teleporting around and you're shooting, and it's still pretty much an online or an on rails. Uh, version of the game it's not necessarily fully flesh compared to you know resident evil 7 which was a great right out the gate type of moment for especially console vr that you know you you were playing the whole resident evil 7 game in vr period like there's no shortcoming even even uh skyrim vr same deal you know it's you're getting the full-fledged skyrim experience in vr you don't you, you can teleport if you want. You don't have to. You could just walk around, whatever. Me, personally, with stuff like that, I need to teleport because, for some reason, I get motion sickness, even though I don't with anything else, but VR gives me motion sickness. Um, but Yeah, you, which is weird because I get motion sick with literally everything. Yeah, and you could... But VR, I could sit there and play, play VR, VR for, like, yeah. five hours. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Which boggles Weird. my mind. Um, the one thing I do like, you know, just kind of kicking off my view of it... Um, the one thing I do like that even though Valve was like, hey, this plays best on index by our, you know, the Valve index where you have, you know, the hand peripherals that you have, the controllers basically truly will make you when you're using them, you could pick up things with Alex's fingers, you know, single singular thing, like individual fingers, pick them up bullets individually. You know, there's so much more realism with it, but you could still play it on you know, HTC Vive, you could play it on Oculus Quest, Oculus Go, or not Go, uh, Oculus Quest, Oculus Rift, um, you could play it on other compatible VR headsets, you know, and obviously not PlayStation VR, it's not on a console, it's only on PC, but, you know, it is nice having that, but to me, I think they kind of leveraged how bad i mean like even even then you're kind of thinking uh, okay well how bad did people at this point want a half-life game um considering you know, the last one that came out was in fuck what was it It was like 2006 7 whenever the last episode of half-life 2 came out or something like that um and you know a lot of people who you know in that 18 to 35 demographic there's some of them who never knew anything about Half-Life, never really played Half-Life, never had that connection. A lot of people who have, who had that innate connection with Half-Life are in their mid to later 30s now, you know, maybe even 40s, where they're connecting more with Half-Life. And they were there for the boom of Half-Life being a real tech showpiece that really fleshed out the immersive sim genre. Um, so it's it's really interesting that they kind of have used Half-Life, the IP of Half-Life to kind of push at at face value. They're using that Half-Life IP to push sales of their Valve Index. Um, At the same time, it it is what it is. They they definitely didn't make it just a, they're they're not, hey, we're just using the Half-Life IP and we're putting out an on-rail shooter type of thing. uh, More of a, you know, a tech demo. It's a full-fledged Half-Life game, a 20-hour Half-Life game. Like, that's great. Um, you know, a lot of people obviously digging it. It's getting rave reviews. It's, like, at mid-90s on Metacritic. Like, it's doing excellent. I just I just feel bad for the people who truly are connect with Half-Life and truly have had a connection with Half-Life for the majority of their life, I'm sure, um, where all they've known is... You know, I love to just, you know, boot up my PC and play through Half-Life 2 and oh, I've been waiting for Half-Life 3 forever. Like these long-term fans who have been like, ah, oh, they're never going to give us another Half-Life. Oh shit, they are, but it's on VR and I got to spend two grand just to get in the door to play. And it's like, 
it just kind of gatekeeps it a little bit. And I would think Valve would want people, you know, excited about that IP again. You know, people are. Which, you know, hopefully means we're going to get a Half-Life 3. Or whatever a Half-Life 3 would be at this point in time in history. You know, whether that is a reboot. And we see, you know, something else spin out of Half-Life for this. So, I, I have high hopes that, you know, we're going to see now... I, the Half-Life IP is not dead. They wouldn't have put this out, and especially now after it's getting rave reviews and it's selling very well for a VR title. I wouldn't be shocked if we get, you know, some kind of new mainline Half-Life game within the next, you know, three to five years. I just right. wouldn't be shocked. I would hope so, because then that that is the, okay, we did this, it really worked out, you guys liked it, but we know what you really want, and that's a mainline Half-Life game that everyone can play for the most part. Um, whether it's on PC and they do console ports later or whatever, you know, so it'll be interesting. Um, I'm for once excited about, I want to go back and play Half-Life 2. I never finished it back in the day. Um, so I would like to go through and play it. Um, but yeah, I'm really curious to see how this kind of pans out because it could go in one or two directions really. So, um, whether it's, you know, Hey, Valve just kind of tickled us a little bit and, you know, kind of cock teased us and put this out, and now they're done with Half Life again, which I would think would be a very stupid thing to do. Or they like money and they're good at making these games, so we want to move technology forward with the next generation of games, and we want to do that with Half Life as well on a, in a mainline format with you know a full fledged PC game or console game. So, Mike, let's head into our big topic. And, you know, I guess it isn't going to be that big because, you know, it's more just kind of conversation about, I want to talk about games that people can play while being quarantined right now. Everyone's stuck up inside right now. You know, I kind of want to talk about just some game recommendations, you know, and we won't, you know, I'm sure this won't be as long of an episode as usual, but, you know, with my Collins was going to join us this week, but something came up. Uh, so we kind of had to dovetail a little bit and try a different, you know, different topic that you know the one we i was going to bring up we'll can till next week and kind of go with that but um you know i want to talk about just games to play while in quarantine you know we're all stuck inside due to the coronavirus pandemic certain you know currently kind of facing the whole world but considering one you're listening to the show chances are high you really like video games brian walters yes shout out to brian walters i think he does listen um which means this is a great time to catch up on some games that you may have missed or still sitting there in your backlog that you haven't touched something you can play online with a group of friends like we've been talking about or just games you want to tackle again so mike today i kind of want to just do some suggestions for games to play while in quarantine so i want each of us to give three games a piece on either xbox one or pc that our listeners should play during their quarantine status you know i want to know what the game is why it stands out to you and why specifically it would be great to jump in to that game now, given the situation. So, Mike, why don't you kick us off here? What's what's one game on either Xbox or PC you think people should play? Oh, excuse can me. I, can I go old school with this at you, all? You can actually absolutely go old school while I like choke on my saliva. Um, <laughs> so yeah, by all means, throw us throw us one out here. Um, the game that I think would be the besides maybe Mike mm-hmm. Collins, if Adam was um, still available uh, all the time with us and he was on this episode, mm-hmm. I think we would all be in uniform agreement that the one game that you need to play while you're on quarantine because you need the time to do so is a game called Elder Scrolls IV mm-hmm. Oblivion. <laughs> one of us was going to bring it up. Um... If, if you haven't played this game in your life for whatever reason... Mm-hmm. But you like RPGs or you're an Elder Scrolls fan. Like, let's say you played Skyrim and you love Skyrim. Mm-hmm. You need to buy Oblivion for Xbox or um, it was actually on Game Pass. So it's on Game it Pass. Still is, yeah. Or buy it on PC. Whichever you want to do, you need to play the damn game. Mm-hmm. The reason why you need to play this damn game is because it is everything that if uh morrowind which was one of the greatest rpgs of all time just for depth for a lot of different reasons and skyrim were to have a baby 
it would make Oblivion because Oblivion takes all the good stuff from Morrowind and all the good stuff. Well, it, it takes all the good stuff from Morrowind and kind of, kind of everything from Morrowind boils it down and gives you basically what you need from Morrowind to get a great experience. But it takes some of the stuff from Skyrim that they dumb down and it expands on it. Um, skill tree is the biggest thing that I can think of with that. Um, just having different skills and different options for your character is definitely the thing that Oblivion still has over Skyrim. Mm -hmm. With all that being said, if you are someone who is turned off from Oblivion based on the graphics, which with this show, with this team, not not want, not me, not Travis, not our um, co-host uh, who's been on hiatus, Adam, or Mike Collins are going to care about is freaking graphics. Okay, we're more of a gameplay-centered friend group. We always have been. Mm -hmm. We always will care more about the gameplay. There is a new um, mod that you can download if you're techie at all. You can download the Sky Oblivion mod, or mod, and now Oblivion is updated into Skyrim's graphics. Um, I've seen videos of it. People are running it. It is live. How hard it is to install and run, I am not sure. I haven't tried it. That is something I want to do for my stream. I want to play Oblivion so damn bad on stream. And I'm going to try to get the Sky Oblivion mod running because I think it'd be good for people to see. And if it's easy, I would like to create a YouTube video or at least be able to explain to people how easy it is to set up. So my first game and my most important game, and as soon as you finish listening to this podcast and you're like, huh, I need a new game to play. Make it Oblivion. If you only want to play through the main quest line, which would be which would be maybe a disservice to the game because the Dark Brotherhood quest line is just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. um, it's only going to take you... It could only take you like 12 hours to play through it if, if you literally just did the main quest line and just bulldozed through it. But I think it's going to hook you and you're going to be in it for a lot longer. That's my game that I would say. My number one game. If I... This is in... And I'm going in sequential order, like what I would rank number one, absolutely mm -hmm. Oblivion. Yeah, no, I, I, that's obviously going to be, uh, that would obviously be on my list too. I figured you were going to kick it off with that. So I left it off mine, but that would hands down be number one on my list because it's so accessible right now, especially on both of these platforms. You could, it's on, it should be on Xbox Game Pass still. And if you do own or if you do have game pass and you do own an xbox series x or xbox series x xbox one x you there is a 4k update with it that pretty much does i think it does 4k 60 for it if not it's 1080 60 so you're getting 60 frames per second while playing the game which is incredible um but if you want to play it on pc you could get the like game of the year edition for like super dirt cheap on steam um, even on like second day, like secondhand sites or whatever, you know, where you can get a CD key for it. Um, highly, highly recommend it. If you're a physical guy, you can go to Walmart. Walmarts are still open. Um, stores like that, they carry the game of the year edition still in an Xbox. It's like Xbox one, Xbox 360, because I like own every single like version of oblivion. Um, I still have, I have the collector's edition. That's the T rated one. Like you have Mike. Um, mm -hmm. back before they had to change the rating on it because of the modding. Um, but they sell it there for like 10 bucks or it's like 10 or $12, something like that. Game of the year edition to get all the DLC and whatnot. Um, I, if you, if you're a PC guy, if you have a P gaming PC, I personally recommend playing it on PC. Um, just because the load times are a little bit better and whatnot. I don't, I can't remember how good they are in Xbox one personally, uh, just cause I haven't played through it on Xbox one. My most recent playthrough was on PC. Um, put that on your SSD. The load times are incredibly fast. Highly recommend that. Um, it's a really easy game to run on your PC, but the amount of content there is just kind of asinine. Um, and I know we keep talking about that. Uh, Mike, Adam, I'm sure will join us for that one. And I, um, we are definitely going to do a oblivion centric show where we kind of go through and talk about our experiences with that and whatnot. That'll be a much, that'll be like a two part episode. Um, but you know, so I don't want to dive in too much on it, but you know, definitely an elder scrolls in game in general is so easy to choose for this just because there's so much depth with it. Um, even a Bethesda game in general, but kind of piggybacking off of that. And I know we kind of, you know, kind of him hawed around a little bit with this game earlier. If you ask me, 
if you're trying to, for a game that I would recommend that is a beefy game, a single player game, a game that you get invested in a single player open world, I, I personally recommend Red Dead 2. Um, I think that's such, right now is such an easy time to get into that because as cheesy as it sounds, you have one of the, you're, with you being locked inside kind of right now, this is an excellent, excellent, excellent game. The fidelity of it, which I know we kind of say, we're not worried about that, which is true. I'm not worried about graphical fidelity that much. Um, you know, if it looks, if it looks excellent, awesome, perfect. But I'm more worried about gameplay and having fun and enjoying it and even getting a great story out of it before graphics come through. Um, but it's a game that captures wilderness and enjoying the outdoors and being immersed in a time period that that livelihood within that environment they capture that so well and being entrenched in a nature field world specifically and living you know off the land like it captures all that so well that i think helps you with being kind of stuck inside right now helps you a lot with dealing with that um not being able to do that you're able to actually go into this beautiful lush world and there's so many nooks and crannies that you can go and find and you know it it, it has this ai system that is so improved that you know the ai adapts to everything going on and they all have every like npc in that game has a schedule and has you know specific things that they're doing and you know, different plot lines that come up that will change and can change game to game, like, or save file to save file. You know, it's, it's truly, truly, truly a Marvel for gaming and the open world genre for sure. And especially the storytelling, storytelling that goes along with that. I personally love it a lot. Um, but you know, I, I, it's one of those games that this is the perfect time to do because you need to dedicate, you know, it's like The Witcher 3. You need to dedicate, like, at least 40 hours to playing through that. It took me... By the time I rolled credits on it last year when it first came out, I've only played through it once. Um, it took me, I think, 50 hours to beat everything. Or to beat, like, the main quest line in the epilogue um, and go through that. And in the epilogue, I'm sure a lot of people, it's been spoiled too, but I'm not going to spoil it again. Um, it opens up a lot more. So, you know, the world becomes much more vast on top of that. So... Um, definitely my recommendation in terms of a long single player RPG esque game. Uh, Mike, what's your next one? First, I need to make a little bit of an adjustment to my first game. Oh, Sky Oblivion. I have seen a lot of videos on it. Mm -hmm. It is apparently in like testing, so it might be hard to get your hands on it. Ah. Um, I just did like further research. I've seen it on Reddit. I've seen it on YouTube videos and stuff, I thought it was it mm -hmm. was open, but nevertheless, um, just letting you know. The second game, well, Travis is kind of taking you on a contemporary tour. Um, so I was going to go a little bit of a different direction with my second game, but since Travis is doing his best to kind of fill you in on what's new around the block, I'm going to go to another game that would be another unanimous um, nod from all of us. Mm-hmm. And this game is on Game Pass. Now, Travis, of course, has said to play this game previous, but he said the Xbox One compatibility was a little strange. Mm -hmm. um, let me let me let me go back a little bit. My second game on the list was going to be Mass Effect. It's on mm -hmm. Game Pass. You can play it. However, with that being said, the Xbox One X port of the game mm -hmm. leaves much to be desired per Travis. Uh, he actually has played it and experienced it. Yeah, I so figured out I figured out what the issue was with that. Well, so so basically when you download when you download Mass Effect off of Game Pass or you put in your Mass Effect Xbox 360 disc and it pull you know it unlocks the download file for it because that's basically all it's doing is basically being just your disc acts as a key for the most part saying okay yeah you physically own this game um but the one thing that it has on there when you start it up and especially if you're playing on Xbox One X and you know it's in 4K or pushing out 4K it's probably not doing phys actual physical 4K of the game um, unless they did put a 4K patch in there but it 
the game is very choppy and it's very noticeably bad in terms of the performance it puts out for it. What I did find out, because a lot of people ask, they're like, what the fuck? Like, what is going on? Um, there is a film grain option on it that literally you take that off and it instantly, the game looks 10 times better and it runs 10 times better. So, um, just keep an eye out for that if you do play Mass Effect. Um, I don't know if Mike's changing his answer or not, but just go into the settings on your X, like on the, when you're in game playing on your Xbox one, there's a film grain or something like that. Some kind of option like that. You'll know what I'm talking about when you see it, just switch that off and it'll be fine. It'll run much better. Sorry. Go ahead, Mike. Oh no, you're good. So I think the second game, I will just go ahead and use mass effect, the original, Mm -hmm. which is available on game pass. Um, I just think that this is a game that, is, is a really good RPG game. It's going to be a big time sink for you because there are mar- multiple storylines going on at once. And while it's kind of a straight line game, meaning your main quest line, you're pretty much on a rail. The biggest thing with it is while you're on this rail, there's a lot of different little jumps you can make from this rail left or right that could give, that could personalize the experience for you. Mm-hmm. You can have different love interests. You can behave certain ways to different parts of your um, crew. You can take certain side quests. Um, I really think Mass Effect being one of the... Um, it's it, it was a groundbreaking shooter RPG, over-the-shoulder shooter RPG. It was a groundbreaking RPG for its time, mm-hmm. and it still withstands the test of time as far as storylines and gameplay is concerned. Mm-hmm. Graphics might li- leave a little bit to be desired, much like Oblivion, but if you haven't figured it out yet, I'm living in the past very much so with these games. I love these games from the past. And it's another game that if you have, even if, even if you haven't considered it, but more importantly, if you've considered it at all in your life, like if you flicked past it on Game Pass and been like, huh, Mass Effect, I've heard such good things about it, but I never played it. Please do yourself a favor. Go back, download it. It's going to be a minimal space on your hard drive. Please go back, give it a try. Worst thing that happens is you sink two hours or three hours of your quarantine into it, and it doesn't like it doesn't hook you, which it will. But if it doesn't hook you, then the worst things you do is delete it and move on and say I'm a jerk and I don't know what I'm talking about, and I'd be completely okay with that. But I promise, I do think a majority of you that are listening to this, if you haven't played Mass Effect, again, just be open. Go into this with an open mind. The two games I've given you. They both, all they require for you to love them is open mindedness. If you go into them not expecting top of line graphics, but you go in expecting great gameplay and great storylines, you will love these two games that I've given you. I promise you that. Yeah. No, that's an excellent, excellent way to, you know, put into perspective with it and how to approach them. Um, On my end, my second one, and I'm going to do, I'm going to do a multiplayer one this time. Um, because it is readily available on Game Pass, even too, um, I'm going to recommend The Elder Scrolls Online. Tamriel Unlimited. The the full, like, you know, base version of The Elder Scrolls Online. It is on Game Pass. It is available. You can go in there, download it right now. It doesn't cost an extra subscription. You can get a subscription that, like, gives you gold or whatever like that. But no subscription required in terms of getting in there and actually physically playing the game like World of Warcraft or other MMORPGs. But um, it's a game that Mike, Adam, and I, and Kyle, too, like, we talk about, like, we should get back in and play that. We should give that another try. Um, And there's a reason behind that, because the amount of love that ZeniMax Online has put into it, um, it's not a Bethesda Game Studio developed game, um, but the amount that they've put into that to appease its fan base first and foremost over actually going and being like, Hey, how can we just like, you know, ring this and get all as much, as much money out of it. Kind of like you're seeing with, you know, at times blizzards done with world of Warcraft, you know, with what a lot of fans say who regularly play that game, um, you know, or other MMO RPGs that haven't necessarily stood the test of time, um, or even live service games. Um, but, you always, always, always hear about Elder Scrolls Online, ESO, and how great that game's turned out to be and how they've turned that game around and they've given players a reason that they should invest their time in and live in this world and, you know, clock days of time into it and actually put 
forward you know building guilds and making friends and leveling characters there's a reason why that's there and you know and it's been great to see so many different areas of tamriel come into that game like they have morrowind they have they're working on a skyrim area right now and exploring certain parts of a skyrim um Morrowind was always the biggest one that came out of that. People were like, holy shit, we could actually finally go and see a modern looking version of Morrowind for the most, you know, most extent. But you're seeing, you know, I'm sure they're going to touch on Hammerfell if, you know, that they also could hold off on certain areas like High Rock or something like that with, um, you know, because that's rumored to be in Elder Scrolls 6. So they may pull back on that a little bit. But the worlds that they're building are so, so, so deep and interesting that people who love Elder Scrolls lore or people who are just fans of RPGs, MMORPGs in general that don't necessarily want to play the same thing like World of Warcraft or, you know, because a lot of MMORPGs have been very copy and paste from World of Warcraft. Um, I've always felt like the handful of times that I've played ESO that it's it, it feels different. So I definitely recommend that and especially on the sole fact that at the end of the day, even if you don't know somebody like you have a friend who has an Xbox, doesn't have Game Pass, they can get in the Game Pass for dirt cheap. And it's something you guys can play during this time. Everybody can play it where they don't actually have to physically go out and buy the game. If you have an Xbox, you're good to go. And I, it might even be on PC, but I know for sure in terms of the version included with Game Pass, it's obviously on PC. That's their biggest, uh, you know, uh, player base PC, I'm sure. But uh, point being, it's very accessible, it's easy to get, and it's easy to jump in, too. So, Mike, let me hear your third one. What are you capping my, off with? My third and final game. So, um, I've kind of given you some really good single-player um, experiences here. Mm -hmm. So, the last game that I was going to give was going to be focusing on multiplayer a multiplayer experience. Mm -hmm. um, however... I do think a game that really deserves your time and effort on this. Um, you know what? I'm, I'm doing it. I'm going old school again. Um, no, you know what? I got to I got to do something contemporary, right? I can't just I can't just keep going back to the old well. It's going to run dry at some point, right? I, I guess not. Let's what are you going with then? Um, so a little bit of a more contemporary experience is still going to be an RPG and it's still going to be single player, mm -hmm. but even if you're not a fan of the South Park series, but oh. it's better if you are a fan of the South Park series would be, um, South Park, the stick of truth, the first game that they created. Mm -hmm. Um, I just think out of an RPG experience especially if you're a south park fan it's everything you would think a south park game would be mm -hmm. it's just like you're in an episode of south park truthfully and it's just it's incredible um i didn't really i was a little bit skeptical i looked up a little bit of information when it first came out and i was like you know what i'll give it a whirl this is when Redbox still had their um their rental system and i wound up playing like 16 hours of it in two days and just beating it so, and I still have it for PC and I have gotten back into it just a little bit recently. And it's one of those games that like, once you start playing it, but before you know it, five or six hours are going to just roll by mm -hmm. and you're going to be like, holy shit, like that happened fast. Yeah. I remember, so, I remember you really plowed through that game whenever it first came out. Mm -hmm. I remember I, I just, like I played, I played a decent amount of it, but then you really went and like got hooked on it right off the bat. Exactly. So it's definitely something that you should check out. Um, it's pretty accessible on Xbox and uh, PC. It's on Steam. Mm -hmm. So you should definitely, um, you know, give that a, give that a check uh, or give that a look-see um, if you're looking for something to play and you're looking for an RPG. And by the way, it's kind of, it's not really like a Final Fantasy game, but it is turn-based combat. So it gives you like, it's an RPG and it gives you that turn-based combat. Yeah. No, definitely. I'm, I've always wanted to go and play. I have, I have the fractured butthole um, on PS. Yeah, PS4. I have it on, but I've always wanted to go back and like actually play that because I enjoyed the first one so much, and people have said a lot of really good things about the second one. Um, it's just it's sat there in my backlog, and it's been one of those games that's like, ah, if I want to play that, I gotta like it's one of those games you got to stick with and it's not going to be necessarily in and out type of thing. Um, 
you know, so it's, it's one of those games that I'm like, oh, I want to play that on Switch because now they have it out on Switch. I'm like, man, that would be a perfect to have on Switch. And I've never pulled the trigger on it, went out and bought it or whatever, you know. So um, even though I have it on PS4, but, you know, it's one of those games that it's just a long, meaty RPG. And when I say long, it's probably 20 to 30 hours, something like that. But, um, you know, it's it, it's just going to take a little bit more with any turn-based RPGs. You know, it's it's going to take a little little bit more to play through it and commit to it. Um, but no, that's an excellent pick. I, that's, like I said, it's one I want to get back to eventually. Now for my last one, this is a little more difficult because I had one in mind that I'm like, eh, nah, I don't, I don't know about that. And then I thought of another one and I was like, well, yeah, but I've talked about that already, which, you know, doesn't hurt it, but. Let's throw something different out. I'm going to go with another multiplayer game, which I'm usually the single player guy. You're usually the multiplayer guy. I'm the single player mm-hmm. guy. But I'm going to go with another multiplayer. The Doom, or Doom, Diablo 3 Eternal Collection. You can get the, okay. the full suite of Diablo 3, the full Diablo 3 experience, PC, Xbox One, PS4 if you want to get it. It's on Switch as well, too. Um, but... They sell it in the Eternal Collection now, which has every single piece of downloadable content for it in terms of, like, the DLC packs, like, the expansions, like Necromancer and, um, what was the, uh, the Reaper of Souls? Um, uh, the Paladin? Yeah, yeah, so they yes. have, the, it includes all of that, and it's actually relatively cheap. I think you get it for, like, 20, 30 bucks now, or whatever, but... That's pretty good. It's it's a it's a game that is very easy to pick up and play across the board for people that, you know, if you're a stats guy, if you're a numbers-crunching guy, if you're somebody who micromanages character builds and whatnot, this fits in for you. It, Diablo's always been like that, but... And correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, but, um, because you're a huge Diablo fan, uh, but especially three kind of gave players more of an option that it may not have leaned in as much for the hardcore audience, but it still did appeal to them in a way. Like at the same time, if you really wanted to get into it, you can't get into it, but it is a mm-hmm. much, it is much more of a casual experience that, you know, it it's adapted for controller. Well, it plays just as it plays natively great on PC in terms of the controls and whatnot, but um, it's very easy to run through kind of power level characters, go through the season ladders that they have. Um, now is a really good time to get in to something like that because you could try out different character builds till you find what you like and what specific character you like playing with. Um, to me, that seems like it's a great value package because like I said, you could probably get it for like 20 bucks, something like that, 20, 30, maybe at the most. Um, but you get all of this content with that. That It's actually one thing that I want my fiance and I to play because she... I'm more of the numbers crunching guy. I like building characters and seeing, you know, what min max I can get on certain things, all that nerdy shit. She's not, she's not into that shit. So, you know, to me, it's, I like going in and doing stuff like that. So I, I've been wanting to play that with her because she can just kind of pick up and play and go with it. And I kind of carry her in certain parts. But to me, it's a really great experience to get in with a group of friends, kind of go through and just say, fuck it. Let's just, plow through the story campaign story's not too too long what do you say mike it's maybe like 10 hours yeah um it, it it's one of those it's it's one of those games where if you've never really played a diablo game in your life then it's going to take you a little bit longer mm-hmm. but if you're a diablo veteran like i was and you've never played Di- diablo 3 for whatever reason mm-hmm. you'll get through it a little faster just because you're used to like it depends on what you're looking for if you're looking for more of like a the, the storyline and experience mm-hmm. then it's going to take you a little bit longer but the older like diablo veterans like you know we're more of a situation where um you kind of get grindy with it mm-hmm. and you're not really wa- paying attention to the story you just want the gear and stuff really just depends on the experience you're looking for but yeah 10 hours at least at the minimum for you to beat the game yeah so it, it's one of those things that you could you know, play for four or five hours sessions of it, like you normally would do with friends as it is already for the most part, especially now. But, you know, if you got a free day and you and your buddies just want to, like, get sweaty for the day, you could easily plow through it and, you know, have a good time with it and build certain characters and, 
you know, all kinds of stuff. And I believe they turned off the auction house for actual, like, physical money now, right? Yes. Okay, I was going to say, because that was a big, that was a lot of people were not happy about that right at the get-go. Um, I remember, dude, I remember when Diablo 3 first came out. One, I remember you buying that, like, right off the rip. Was, did you get your gaming PC just for that? Or did you have it on, like, running on one of your older ones? No, I I did not get this gaming PC just for that. I got this gaming PC to play Counter Strike, uh-huh. um, but it it ran on older PCs back then. Yeah, I was gonna say because I I remember you getting it, and then I bought it like right when it came out. It was like a day or two after. Um, but I got <laughs> somebody posted a like fake manufacturer coupon for it, so I got it for like fifteen dollars or twenty dollars or something like that. Like right when it came out, when it was like sixty bucks. Ah. Uh, me being the little, like, shitter I was, like, at 18 or whatever in college. Like, I, it was right after my freshman year of college. I remember that. But um, running it on my, like, old-ass MacBook then, too. Like, <laughs> dude, it felt like my fucking bed was going to catch on fire. I was like, this is easily a fire hazard right here. But, like, <laughs> going through being the butcher for the first time, like, it's a very rewarding game. It, to me, who's more casual with Diablo, I feel it's a pretty rewarding game. Especially, like, if it's a game you're wanting to get like play something with a group of friends and just jump in there and have a good time and not necessarily worry about, you know, one person, like one person may be great at, you know, speed, uh, like power leveling a character or, you know, flying through a lot of the story campaign. Cause they try to do, you know, uh, seasonal ladders or whatever, but you know, people like somebody like our friend Kyle, who's like kind of newer to games in, you know, some regard, he, or he doesn't play as many games and he's now getting more into games like he can come in and still play a valuable role it's almost like the overwatch experience that you know everybody can fill a role and still have fun with it while doing it if you want to play in a casual sense like everybody can still have fun with it so mike i think that's going to do it for our second quarantined episode now i want to play d3 thanks yeah. dude well i'll reinstall it and that's <laughs> we'll tell adam we'll tell kyle kyle can get to actually i may have an well uh, I was thinking, oh, well, I, I think I have an extra one, but obviously the CD key probably doesn't work for it. But D3 is super cheap to get anyways, especially on PC. So, I don't know. I'll reinstall it. <laughs> now we're planning ahead. Um, But, yeah, I think that's going to do it for our episode, Mike. Why don't you tell everyone where they can find you at on the interwebs and where they can watch you play video games at? You can find me on Twitter at T-O-Y-S-X-L-D-I-E-R. And more importantly... I have been streaming a lot more on Twitch. I'm on a four day streak, <laughs> which is a big deal for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, at MP underscore toy soldier. I've been playing a lot of dead by daylight mixed in some five nights of Freddy's the other night, but I do need to get a playthrough of oblivion in and I need to do some other things on my stream. So please hop over there and uh, come check me out. Um, friendly. I'll talk to you about anything. You can come tell me that mass effect or oblivion both suck and that I'm an idiot. And I will say, okay, that's your opinion, man. And that's that. <laughs> Travis, how about you? Uh, you can find me, as always, I'm your host, Travis Wade, a.k.a. Travis, on most internet platforms. You can find me on Twitter at Travis underscore, that's T-R-A-V-L-E-S-S underscore. You can also fe- see me streaming time to time on twitch.tv slash Travis underscore, same as Twitter, uh, which I, I'm i now kind of wanting to get back into streaming a little bit. I haven't, I haven't streamed in a while, really since the end of last summer, just because work gets crazy for me during the school year. Um, but there have been a couple of games I do want to stream, not Xbox related, but I've never beat Legend of Zelda Wind Waker. I kind of want to play through that on stream. Um, I've been talking about myself doing an Oblivion stream uh, just because that game's fucking fantastic. Um, but just in general, I've been kind of wanting to set up like streams with our community in general and do whether it's viewer games or listener games, I guess, for our case, um, games with listeners or just starting a playthrough session that our listeners can interact with us more. Um, but easiest way to do that right now is through Mike's stream. Go over there. That is MP underscore toy soldier over on Twi- Twitch dot TV. Um, but mine is same as Twitter. Uh, twitch.tv slash travelers underscore same as Twitter. So after all that, um, and you could also, if you want to play some games with me, you can go over on Xbox live where you can find me at just regular travelers, T R A V L E S S one day. I'm going to just have travelers, no underscore on everything. And that'll be miraculous. It'll be awesome. Um, but Mike, that's going to do it for our episode this week. Thank you so much for everyone for listening. And this has been your newest episode of 
the Game Pass Gamecast, your weekly go-to podcast for all things Xbox and Xbox Game Pass, including news, rumors, and conversations around them damn good video games. You can catch new episodes of the show each and every Friday morning when they drop on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and all other major podcast services. So be sure to subscribe to us wherever you get a podcast at and follow us on Twitter at GPGC Podcast. Stay up to date with everything regarding the show, video games alike, and our dope giveaways, which we're cooking up a couple of more. You saw Geeks360 at the beginning of the episode. One Doom Eternal, right off of us. Beat it before me. I was the one who was fucking pumping Doom's tires for how long, and he's out there fucking dude, beat it for me. Dude, not only were you pumping the tires, but you were doing it with a hand pump. You were sitting yeah. there pulling it up and putting it down like that Mario Party mini game. Yeah. Straight fucking <laughs> uh, 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 not even having an air compressor. <laughs> exactly. He's got a goddamn air compressor. He's already in and out, baby. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we will be giving more dope stuff like that away later this year, so be sure to follow us on Twitter and make sure you stay up to date with all that. And now, Mike, with all that being said, that's it for our show this week. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening, tuning in, sharing, and being a part of this growing community. Game on. Wash your goddamn hands, and we'll see you next week. Wash your ass, too. Sure, and wash your ass. Why not?